Okay, everybody, welcome back to our Materials Minute playlist. Today, I'm talking about an article that can be found in the journal Cold Region Science and Technology. That's right. I didn't know this journal existed, but I'm delighted that it does because check out this article. This is an article written on ski wax, which is relevant because here in Utah, it's November and the ski season has begun. So it's probably a bunch of people out there busting out their ski wax, getting ready to wax up their skis. And what this article talks about is an analysis of fluorinated, non-fluorinated, and bio-based waxes, right? This was written by none other than my friend, Dr. Jeffrey Bate. There he is. Interesting guy. From Utah, grew up in Utah, never learned how to ski. And yet he is a fantastic researcher on skiing. In fact, he's one of the leading experts on ski wax. Back in 2018, if you follow the, the magazine Popular Science, every year at the end of the year, they have their 100 greatest inventions. And back in 2018, he actually invented Phantom Ski Wax by DPS, right? DPS Skis, it's a company based out of Salt Lake City. They make amazing high-end skis, actually. And he came up with this uh, a wax treatment that is a one-time treatment. So you don't have to keep on applying this over and over. Pretty rad. But in this article, they're going to be talking about fluorinated, non-fluorinated, bio-based. Why? Why bother? It's important because actually five years ago, the International Ski and Snowboard Federation, they set a rule that we're not going to be using PFAs-based uh waxes anymore. You can read all about it. They have this whole article where they talk about why we're getting rid of PFAs. These are polyfluoral alkyl substances. You've heard of these. They're getting into the water that we drink. They're actually, they call these the so-called forever chemicals. You know, there's all these different health implications that have been identified in you, know, you see what happens in men and in women. Really, it's not a good thing. And yet they're showing up because we're using them on the mountains that gets into our water supply and then we end up drinking this stuff. So places all over are getting rid of these if they are based on fluorinated PFAs, right? Um, by the way, this came out in 2019. They said that they would start enforcing it in 2021 and they did. Last year, this skier, I'm gonna botch the name, but Ragnhild Moinkel uh, in Zolda in Austria. This is a Norwegian skier. She was actually disqualified qualified. This is a former silver medalist in the Olympics. Total bummer for her, but she was actually disqualified because they found that she'd been using flooring-based wax on her skis. Um, total bummer. So what does this article cover? This article is really interesting. I talked to Jeff about it and he's like, well, ever since that they decided to get rid of fluorinated waxes, people had always sort of assumed that that was the important aspect to it. The going hypothesis is that when you have your skis, there's a thin layer that forms between the ski and the snow surface of water, right? And that water is actually enhancing the glide. But really that's never been demonstrated. And there's a lot of sort of assumptions about what's causing better performance. And there's not a lot of data. So he said, he's like, we wanted to test that uh, hypothesis about whether or not hydrophobic components like these you know, PFAs were actually the important thing to get better ski glide performance and understand really the physics of it altogether. So in this article, if you look at it, they do a bunch of chemical analysis to figure out what these different waxes are made of. And it's the stuff that you'd expect to see, right? They're doing UV Viz, they're doing Raman, they're doing DSC. They're trying to get a feel for what's in these things and they're identifying some uh, chemical species that are there or not. One of the interesting things is they found that really when it came down to uh, the coefficient of friction, which they can measure, some of their preliminary results, by the way, on this are awesome. They have this preliminary uh, preprint where you can see their test setup. Here it is, right? They actually had this sort of ghetto rig where they would actually get some of their skis, mount it on there, run it down a track to get it going. And then it had this long straight section and using video cameras, they would monitor the rate in this sort of run section as well as the run out. Um, Pretty awesome. They would measure the position accurately and from that they could actually calculate the coefficient of friction. What they found is that when they were waxing it, the original treatment obviously is not staying there. And people have known this. There's a reason why you have a really great first run when you wax your stuff right here. But then when you do 3000 feet of descent, for example, it's completely different. It's actually a higher coefficient of friction. It's changing. So one of the things that they studied in this most recent article is okay, what's the role of these different chemical functional groups and the role that they play on glide performance? And one of the things they found is that, honestly, the chemicals there are not even perhaps as important as other factors that are also very important, like the surface morphology, which is why those base grinds, right? The grind itself that you put on the base of your skis is really important. So 
what you saw here in this preliminary work is really sort of early days stuff. They've since gotten serious about it. Actually, they've gone to the University of Innsbruck in Austria that has this amazing sort of linear trebometer. And so there's a separate article coming out soon where they're going to be studying that. But today's Materials Minute is on ski wax. Happy skiing, everybody.